What a good day. It's a good day to come and sing these songs. I could have sang about ten more songs just together, Lane. You know, this morning, I, I woke up this morning and we try to be original. We try to think of a, a good text and something to talk about. And so I got up and I was, you know, watching one of the other services at the Louisville Church of Christ. And the, the preacher there, I'm good friends with him, his name's Jeff Jenkins, and he gets up there and, and I'm just listening this morning and he said, we're going to talk about the last words of Jesus. And my heart just sung, I was like, what? But at the same time, you know, it's a different, he went a different direction, so uh, I'm thankful that, uh, that we all can preach on such a good text. But he, he went all through the seven, and so we're not going to go through all seven this morning. But I want to say before we get to that, you know, I miss specific things. You probably do as well. I miss learning, you know, to play dominoes in here with, with a bunch of you. I miss on Focus Sunday watching who's going to bring in what food item and setting up the tables together and the, and the conversation one-on-one -on -one without worrying about spreading anything. I miss that. There's a lot of things that I miss. I miss just chilling after services and not worried about anything, you know? But it's going to come back, brethren. And I look forward to that. This is not a drill if you understand that. As Christians, we press on. As Christians, we remain steadfast and faithful and we look to things ahead. And when it's over, we're going to appreciate and we're going to contemplate the blessings that we have in connection more than we ever did. And we're going to come back stronger. My wife said last week, she said, if we don't use this pandemic somehow to glorify God, then it was in vain. You know the term, he died for me? Is, is one of the most stirring languages anyone could ever hear. He died for me. It makes me want to sing out how great is our God. Just from the depths of everything, just to sing about His, His goodness and His grace and His mercy and how He died for me. It makes me want to uh, think about second chances because of the cross. The phrase He died for me tells me to to see life in a different way. To see the cross. It, it, and, and it ought to be inseparable in our life, in our speech, in our actions. And in a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together, as we do every Lord's Day. And we're going to look at the cross. And remember the cross. But this morning, I want to look at one statement that Jesus made at the end, there in His last days, his last words. You know, we look at last words and a lot of our favorite last words is, hey, y'all watch this. That always ends well, doesn't it? It has in my life. I mean, it's, some of them have been really, really bad, like popcorn in somebody's face. Uh, but, you know, or wonder, you know, I wonder what would happen if we hit this with a baseball bat. You know, or somebody here understands what I'm saying there. Or, or maybe somebody's last words might be, well, well, Oakley, she's cute. Let's take her out on a date. You know, that's famous last words. That, you'll see the rage monster come out. But no, we look at last words. Look at, look at Luke 23 with me. Luke 23. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. In verse 33, 2333, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And they cast lots, divided up his garments among themselves. I want to look at just the kind of the, the textual side of this, and then we're going to close with a practical side and a way to apply this to us today. So first, Textually, we look at, well, what's on his mind? What's on his mind when he says this? David Farr wrote one time, an author, he said that it shouldn't surprise us, even in the midst of his agony, that he's praying for us, that he's praying for those persecutors. 
that he's asking the Lord for their forgiveness. Some ancient writers believe that, this, that these words were actually spoken early, probably maybe earlier than we thought, maybe at the time when they're nailing the, the nails into his hands and into his feet, that he may have spoken these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I know if I, you know, if we were being crucified, I might be thinking about my own sin. I might be thinking, thinking, Father, forgive me. But Jesus didn't need that, did he? He didn't need to say, Father, forgive me. He was perfect. There's a few things we've got to keep in mind contextually as, this, as we go forward. And number one is this. What does this text say about his relationship to the Father? Think about that. Well, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? You notice here he doesn't use the casual term, just God, will you forgive them? He doesn't use that term in, a, in a, just a broad sense, you know, deity is what I'm saying. Will you forgive them? He says the words, Father. He didn't say Lord in a respectful, honorable manner. He said, Father. There's a lot of people out there in the world that we come across that maybe don't believe that Jesus is actually God's son. This is one verse that we would turn to, isn't it? Or rather, when he said, when he's baptized by John the Baptist, and the Father speaks to the Son, Beloved, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. But here he says, Father. In Aramaic, Abba, Father. The term which, is, which coexists in parallel with, with Daddy. Think about how, how much that speaks. He also said this in his words he addressed to the Father in the garden. In Romans 8.15, I'm reminded of that, where we have received the spirit of adoption and we cry out, Abba. The God we, you know what that says? The God that we serve is not far away from us. Think about the relationship that Christ has with the Father to say, Father, forgive them, and the relationship that we can have with the Father as well. He's not far from us. He's not sometimes that people picture God like, as with a, a, a gavel, I guess, as a judge to can't wait to pronounce someone to hell. Is that what we have here? As he watched the soldiers grab those spikes or those nails and they're mocking him and they're, they're you know, tearing apart his flesh, they're spitting on him. Think of the relationship he's, he has with the Father. To be able to say, Father, forgive them. Secondly, in this text, we must consider how he is living his own instruction. He's living what he taught. Well, what did he teach? You, you know, he stood on the mountain with his disciples and he said those words, if you forgive men their trespasses, remember that in Matthew 6, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Matthew 6, 14. Or, or he said, ask and it shall be given unto you in Acts chapter 7 and verse 7. Or he said, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask of him? And he said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Remember those, but I tell you scriptures in the Sermon on the Mount, but I tell you. And he says here, pray for those who persecute you. In order that you may be sons of your Father, in heaven. He is living his own instruction. And, and, for, and he says later on, he says, For if you love those who love you, in Matthew 5, what reward do you have? Is it, it's, he's saying it's easier to love those who love you, is it not? It's easy to love my mama, okay? It's easy to love those who love you. What about those who are persecuting you? What about those you might call your enemy? Jesus is not just making statements here. He is trying to make an impact on you and I. He's teaching. We have to see these statements as a teaching method. He, he's living what he taught. Thirdly, we've got to consider who the they are. Who is them in this text? Father, forgive them. Well, we might think it's the soldiers. Probably so. That first comes to my mind, maybe... Maybe, you know, it, and we think about the soldiers, what they're thinking or what they're doing. Maybe this wasn't new to them. 
Maybe this is just the same old routine, crucifying someone. This is just another criminal on the cross, nailing his hands and his feet. Maybe they're following orders, but remember the centurion said, wait a second, remember? Surely this was the Son of God. Maybe Christ was praying for Pilate or the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Maybe you and I are included in that, and I believe we are. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 2 with me for a second. I, I don't know where you are on bringing your Bible to worship, but I'd like to try to convert you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's always good to have it with you. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. And he himself, I may have it up here, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. But not for what reason? Well, look, that we might die to sin. Where are you in that? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. Peter understands our sins nailed him to the cross. He went there to carry our sins. Fourth, I, I look at this text and I think about, well, what did it mean they know not what they do? Why? What did he mean by that? Why would they need forgiveness if they didn't know what they were doing, as some people have asked? If they didn't know what they're doing, why do they? Well, that's the answer. They should have known. That's the, in, in a thought there. They, you know, maybe they're convicted in their ignorance here. Ignorance used in a good way, not a, not a negative way. But they're unknowing, their ignorance, the meaning they should have known. I mean, we look at the evidence, the signs, the miracles, the wonders that Jesus performed. They should have known. But I think of what they're doing. And one scholar wrote this. He said, our English language cannot convey the depth of what they were doing to our Savior. It can't convey it. I, it's hard to write it down in words, isn't it? It was malicious. It was immoral. It was barbaric. It was unjust. It was un, uh, ungodly. And it was shameful. And the selfish part of me wants to respond to this and say, well, well Lord, they knew what they were doing. But the truth is, even his own received him not, John 1.11. So the answer brings to mind 1 Corinthians 2.8. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. None of the rulers understood it. Look at that. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Think about that. None of the rulers understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Yet even when what they were doing, Jesus didn't keep them so far away from a prayer to ask for their forgiveness. Now I want to get to the applicable part of this, the practical side, before I lose time. Someone once told me, that the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3 is one of the highest, loftiest things that we could ever reach as a child of God. Those qualifications, I mean, they are. I, I set them as goals even in my life. But think about it. What about this? I think that's wrong. I think this is the highest. To love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, not years later, at the same time they're doing it. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? Maybe that's the highest at, at all. I, you know, I don't know about you, I hate it when people misunderstand my good intentions. That's one of my pet peeves. When you're trying to do something good and somebody, you know, distorts it or thwarts it in a way as to think, to, to misunderstand you totally. I can't, in fact, 10... 15 years ago, something huge in my life happened where somebody misunderstood something I was trying to do as good and it got political and it got all, all this other thing started happening. And I remember thinking, Lord, can you please help them understand what I was trying to do? But they didn't. 
I remember praying, Lord, do you understand? Does he? Does he ever? Does he ever understand being misunderstood? The first sermon I preached when I moved to Oklahoma City, when we moved to Oklahoma City, was, was on, one of the first was on forgiveness, and it was tough. And afterward, an older lady came up to me and she said, uh, she said, you didn't know it, but just about a few months ago, before you got here, someone just murdered my son. And I want you to know I can't ever forgive him. Well, you talk about tough to know what to say. And I, kind of, I just started talking. I said, well, maybe this is something you can work towards forgiveness. And, and I started talking about, you know, with God as your helper and you can get through it. You know, I was thinking of Joseph, you know, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And we went through a conversation and she later started working towards forgiveness. The pulpit commentary says this. To dismiss all vindictive purposes, all resentful thought, to look at our enemy's procedure in a kindly light, and to take, as Christ did here, a generous view. Can you do that? When Jesus said they know not what they do, I think he was generously searching for ways to understand and grant them forgiveness. Yes, and somebody says, well, wait a second, they would have to have godly sorrow. Wait a second, they would have to ask for forgiveness. Wait a second, they would. yes, but Jesus is ahead of them. Jesus is ahead of them, and he's praying for that. These soldiers, I, I can't stress, you know, they're following orders, yes. They're crucifying a criminal, but they're murdering the prophesied Messiah. And the truth is, in application, we can be hurting other people. I hope you're hearing this. We can be hurting other people and not know it. We can be hurting them by our actions. We can be hurting them by what we say or do and be oblivious to it and not realize the harm that we're causing. I, I wrote an article a few years, maybe it was a year ago, called, You Won't Have My Hate in the Newspaper. And I want to practice that more. I mean, that's tough, isn't it? You won't have my hate just like that. And that's the example that Jesus is setting forth. You, we can choose right now that someone will not, we will not be hateful towards someone. That's the example of Christ. You can nail my hands to the cross, he's saying. You can spit on me. You can unjustly crucify me. Uh, you know, and I won't allow you He's saying to reach a point where I'm going to speak in revenge at you. Isaiah 53. I remember reading about Diogenes, the Greek philosopher, and another philosopher, Antisthenes. And Antisthenes thought he was repulsive. And so Antisthenes picks up his stick and comes to Diogenes, and he's going to hit Diogenes. And Diogenes says, strike me. Strike me, Antisthenes, but you will never find a stick hard enough to drive me away from you. Think about the depths of that. Think about what if we had that attitude with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Harmfully say what you will about me, whatever it is. Be rude, be, be malicious. Gossip about somebody, but listen, you will never have a stick hard enough to drive me away from the love that I have for you. Imagine if every member had that thought, which all initiates here with Christ. You know, Christ saw his persecutors. You know, I think what we do sometimes is we, we pick, we have an enemy. Okay, some of you have enemies, right? We have enemies. Maybe, I don't know. You have an enemy, and this is your enemy, and you know what we do after that? I've done it. We place a period after that. And what does Jesus do? He says, no, 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 no. Here is the value of a soul. I was in a preacher's meeting one time, and the preacher, one of the preachers at a breakfast was this several years ago talking about how wrong this brother was. He's wrong, and he goes on and on, and then later on, yeah, you know, I said before, that brother is wrong. Another minister friend of mine, kind of my, one of my mentors in life, he, he pipes up and he says, 
Okay, he's wrong. What are we going to do about it? Folks, it's easy to say somebody's wrong. It's harder to take the next step. This week, I want to practice this more. And I say this starts with me. I, I'm going to go backward. You know, some of you have been watching some of the videos that I've posted recently and trying to encourage people in the body of Christ and things like that. I want to go backwards in my videos and I want to start each day and practice each one that I posted in some way in that day. Practice what we post. Imagine that. It's easy to type it out and post it, isn't it? I'm guilty. It's harder to practice it. In closing, you know, I remember about President Truman in 1945, he honored a conscientious objector during the war. 1945. The guy wouldn't carry a firearm. And why honor someone who's not going to carry a firearm, right? Well, he honored Desmond Doss was his name. He entered the military but refused to kill an enemy soldier or carry a weapon because of his religious beliefs. Some of you know this. He was a non-combatant medic. Wouldn't carry a rifle. He was a medic. But he was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1945. One of the rarest awards to, to earn that award, and he saved countless of lives of fellow soldiers under fire in World War II, and at one point, Desmond was praying, Lord, please help me save just one more. And without a rifle. Brothers and sisters, in our lives, we'll come across people who we don't agree with. We'll come across people who persecute you. May even call you names. They may say things to harm you. They may not care that they do. But I say we turn back to Luke 23 and remember the very words of Jesus. A caring, compassionate child of God who understands the value of a soul will not set a closing date on someone's soul. You know, I've heard, I've heard people say the words, I'm lost, and they seek to change their life. At one time, we were all lost. At one time, we we're all away from Christ. In closing, I want to say this before we close. The devil is using all kinds of his trickery and his maneuvers right now to find ways to divide the body of Christ. Old, young, rich, poor, King James Version, NIV Version, masks, no masks. They were nailing Jesus' hands and feet to the cross. And he prays, Father, forgive them. For they don't realize what they're doing. You know what the Lord is saying here in this? Give them another chance. Did they receive another chance? Remember in Acts 2? Peter told him, you crucified the Son of God. And he told them what they must do. They weren't saved by Jesus' prayer. They were saved in, a, in obedience to what Peter was telling them they need to, be, to do to become a Christian. A second chance. A second chance. I want to ask you a question this morning as we close. What if we saw each morning as we get up, I hope you do, this is a new day, a new start. How many of us need that? You know how many times I need a new start? All the time. You know how many times I need to ask for forgiveness and maybe there's someone this morning that needs to plead for forgiveness to Christ. And may, I don't know where you are, but maybe you need a second chance. I, I'm reminded where in, when Jesus says in Revelation 2 and 7, to him who overcomes. Now think about that. We could do a sermon on just the word overcome, but to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Where are you right now? You need to start over. 
I think there's a misnomer that we gather and we gather to worship God. That's exactly right. But there's a misnomer that sometimes we gather and if we hear the greatest exegetical sermon using a uh, hundred verses of the Bible and, and if we have a theological thought and a good story and a good poem and a good invitation, well then we're good. What about the opportunity this morning to start over? We can't forget that. If there's a child of God this morning, whether you're online or wherever you are, maybe you need to start over just in your seat in your relationship and your dedication to the Lord. You can do that this morning. Let's stand and sing.